I invite you to look with me. We're going to look at two portions of Scripture here, both in Hebrews, for this message as we continue to go through the different names of Christ and titles. And in this message, we're considering him as the author of salvation. We're still in the A's, but not for much longer. Author of salvation. Jesus Christ. Stop and think about what that means for him to be the author of salvation. And the first scripture reference we're going to look at is in Hebrews chapter 5. In verse 9. Hebrews chapter 5. And verse 9. We'll go up to verse 8. Speaking of Christ's learning obedience though he were a son yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and notice being made perfect he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him and then verse 10 says called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek so that's going to be one of the references that we're going to consider together how is Christ the author of eternal salvation, everlasting salvation? And then over in Hebrews chapter 12, we have the same word used. And uh, probably you know this just as well as the one we looked at in Hebrews 5, 9. Hebrews 12 and verse 1 it says wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses there you have to go back to Hebrews 11 and understand that the cloud of witnesses are those that were the Lord's in the Old Testament to whom was given the revelation of Christ when it says by faith Abraham or by faith Moses you can put by Christ Abraham when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance obeyed faith there is used as the synonym of the revelation of Christ as the revelation of his person and his work and so we're compassed about with these witnesses that doesn't mean they're up in heaven looking down and watching us running our race no their thoughts are on Christ alone but it says let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us which I believe would be unbelief and let us run with patience the race that is set before us we can't run their race for them it's over but we won't run the one that God has appointed us to and here in verse 2 it says looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. So there is that word again. Christ the author and finisher. You see our is an italic really of faith. So that means again we have a definition here of faith. People talk about faith as if it's something they produce. No. He is the author and finisher of faith. If it's faith he's the author and he's the finisher. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So here we have in these two scriptures alone, and there's a number of others that we're going to look at to help us understand better the meaning of what it is for the Lord Jesus Christ to be the author if you look over with me in Acts chapter 4 and verses 10 through 12 we can see in this portion of scripture for example and we'll come back to this these two references that I began with but I want you to see the the larger message that we find in scripture that shows how the Lord Jesus Christ is the author 
of salvation. Here in Acts chapter 4, in the message that the apostle Peter is preaching, you can't read it without underestimating the importance of what he says here in Acts 4, beginning with verse 10, be it known unto you all and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that's what we're doing here, studying the name. Name refers to his character and his person, his work. Whom ye crucified, for they didn't see God's glory in him, else they would not have crucified him. But whom God hath raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. They had healed, the Lord had healed a man at the entrance of the, the temple. And now they were be called, being called to question. And Peter says, verse 11, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. See, all that would, had been prophesied in the Psalms, which is become the head of the corner. And here it is in verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other. So when we talk about Christ being the author of salvation, it's another way of saying there is salvation in none other. For there is none other name, there it is again, so we're studying his name as the author of salvation, under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. So for him to be the author of salvation, that means all of salvation originates with him and is through him and by him and to him. And another way that the Lord put it, if you look over in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. It would be sufficient if we only had what the writer to the Hebrews wrote. But when we read other scriptures, all of a sudden now it begins to jump out of the page to us. In Matthew chapter 11, and the Lord was facing much unbelief in the various places where he went to preach. And he pronounced judgment up there in verse 23 on Capernaum. That's where he was raised. That's where he spent most of his time preaching. And yet he told them that if the mighty works which had been done in them had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. I say unto you, verse 24, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom it's an amazing statement. It will be more tolerable for homosexuals in the day of judgment. It doesn't mean that they escape judgment, but as far as what they these knew with the very Son of God living in their midst, and yet they refused him, it would be more tolerable than for thee. And at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Why wasn't our Lord distressed by all this unbelief? It's because he is the author of salvation. He knew who it was that his father had given him that he should come and redeem and justify. And he said, even so, verse 26, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And here's the part in verse 27. Again, when we think about who he is as the author of salvation. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So that puts our Lord squarely in that place of being the author. None can know him apart from those that he is pleased to reveal himself unto. And we can look at a number of different references, but I just want to underscore those. You look around today, there are a lot of religions 
that offer salvation or rewards for a life well lived. And I'll even include in that most of what is called Christian today. Preachers are preaching a method of rewards. If you do this, then God will do this. If you take the first step, then God will do the rest. Christ is not going to repent for you. You have to repent then. He can do the rest. See, all of that is being preached under a message of works and rewards and offers. But that's not what the scriptures teach. When you talk about the faith that's revealed in the Bible, and we're going to come back here and look at this in Hebrews 12, where it talks about him being the author and finisher of faith, of the faith, you find one message, and that is that all of salvation is summed up in who Christ is and why he came and what he accomplished and where he is now. And that he is that foundation that has been laid apart from which no other foundation can be laid. We already read about how the religious leaders of Christ's day rejected Christ as the stone and went about building on another foundation. But this, what we're seeing here in this message about Christ being the author of salvation and this is what gets people upset because it literally eliminates anything else by way of worship just like we read there in Acts 4 there is no salvation other than in him and so therefore that's where people you know get upset you're telling me in all this world, this is the only way in which God saves sinners. Yep. If we believe the Bible. If we don't, let's go out and burn them. Let's take our Bibles out and burn them. I can't even fathom doing that. But people tr truck into their places of worship with the Bible under their arm. And they've got all these different systems. Someone was talking to me the other day about different colors they've got for different promises. And that's all people are reading. It's an index of of things for their own well-being but they don't know anything of Christ there's no true church in anything that is described by what we know as churches today that's a, a word that people like to say well our church is over here we go to here to church the word church means a called out ones so you've got people that deny that God has chosen a people and given them to his son for whom Christ came. They deny that, and yet they still want to put that name church on their building. There is no true church found in these places where Christ alone is not exalted. And that's what's the offense of the gospel. This gospel is exclusive and discriminating. Grace is discriminating. Because God gives it to whom he will. So having looked at that. Let's come back here now to these two key references in Hebrews. First in Hebrews chapter 5. And look at what it means. For Christ to be the author of eternal salvation here. See it took him coming and living a life. And working out, as it says there in verse 8, this obedience that was required. There are some that get this backward and they say, well, as, as soon as God purposed the salvation of his elect before the foundation of the world, they were saved. No. Nope. They were purposed to salvation. But it took him coming as a man... And suffering, as it says there in verse 7, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard and that he feared, though he were son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. 
So here it says, and being made perfect, it's not that there was ever any imperfection in him, but the word perfect there means complete. In other words, there's a starting point to which it builds, and when it was completed, then he became the author of eternal salvation. If you run into somebody and they tell you they're an author, what's the first thing you're going to ask them? Well, where's the books? What, what books have you written? Well, I haven't really written any books, but I have a plan. I purpose to do so. Well, they're not an author. Here when it says that he is the author of eternal salvation, that means from the time he came and completed this, it took him coming to work it out and then being made perfect, complete. That word literally means, when it says being perfected, completed as a man, as the God-man, having earned and established that righteousness necessary, then he became the author of eternal salvation to all, unto all them that believe. And so we don't dare minimize in any way for the sake of God predestinating all things and saying, well, then it was done when the predestination was done. No, the predestination was the purpose that it should be done. And that's why the scriptures say in the fullness of the time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made of a law, to what? Redeem. If they had already been redeemed, and I keep hearing people misquoting Revelation 13. Oh, it says there his blood was slain before the fountain. No, it doesn't. It's since the foundation of the world, his blood was shed. There was no blood in, in heaven. Christ didn't have a body. That's why Hebrews says, a body hast thou prepared for me. All of this was necessary to the outworking of salvation, of which Christ is the author, that in, by, and through him, salvation should be accomplished. Now, when we look back now, we can see it has been accomplished. That's the glorious message of the gospel that it took Christ coming because without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins everything through the sacrifices was done looking forward to his his coming and completing in his coming that salvation that was necessary but it wasn't done until it was done and uh, that's why in verse 10 here, he's called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You can't really understand the writer to the Hebrews without going back and understanding the Old Testament. Because what he does is shows how the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ. It's one of the greatest letters that I can recommend you reading and reading and rereading in the New Testament and look up the cross references because it's full of the Old Testament but it has one purpose to show that Christ came and fulfilled it all there's not an image there's not a type of the Old Testament that has not been fulfilled and uh, there's another point that I would make when people say well Abraham and David they were already justified because some say they were justified from before the foundation of the world. Others say that it was by their faith that they were justified. But that's not what the scripture says. Had they been justified, they would no longer have had to offer sacrifices. That's what the writer to the Hebrews says a little later on as you read on through these chapters that it was necessary that those sacrifices be offered until Christ came and fulfilled all of that. Over in, in the Hebrews 10, it says, For the law having a shadow of what good things to come. It was already fulfilled, and you can't speak of good things to come. 
and not the very image of the things. The law wasn't the actual reality. But it says what? Can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Those sacrifices couldn't redeem. They were a picture of the Redeemer. But if there had actually been redemption and justification for those of the Old Testament, verse 2 tells us, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. You would expect that if justified, then there's no more need for the sacrifice. But the reality is they weren't. In those sacrifices, verse 3, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world. Keep reading all the way down through there. That's how he's the author. And again, think of a writer. Yes, it was purposed from before the foundation of the world, but the script began to be written when he came. And he earned and established that righteousness. And when it was complete, like we're reading over here. And that's why it gives the example here of Melchizedek as an high priest that's according to what is said in Psalm 110, verse 4. The resemblance between Melchizedek and Christ. There's many things that are said of the one that agree with the other as far as their person. For example, there's a likeness in Melchizedek to Christ in that it says of Melchizedek he was without father and without mother. In other words, there was no lineage to which it could be traced. And in his office as a priest, and in the manner of his being placed as that, that priest, everything pertaining to him is now, we're told here that it was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. I tend to think that he may well have been Christ made an appearance in the flesh. He was the king of Salem. That's, that's a king of peace. Melchizedek means a king of righteousness. Righteousness and peace have kissed one another. And so I believe that's why he's used here as an example on the heels of what the writer said there in verses 7 through 9 as the high priest that Christ being the author of eternal salvation. Melchizedek being the type. He's a priest forever. Melchizedek's no longer around. And this was said to. Dissuade any that. Particularly the Jews. You realize Hebrews is written to. To the Jewish people. Of the time. Who still questioned whether or not. Christ was the Messiah. Well there should be no question. Especially when we read. He's the author of salvation. Now let's look over in Hebrews chapter 12, where we see the same reference to Christ being the author. And here, just as in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, the description that we have there of Christ, it says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man or for each one, is the way that should probably read. Here we have the description that precedes the, the mention of his name, looking unto the author and finisher, that word finisher would be perfecter of faith. Our, as I said already, is in italic of what faith is. And that first word is very similar to what we find, for example, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 26. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 26, it says, esteeming the reproach of Christ, 
greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. When it says he had respect, that means that Moses, he wasn't looking at what was being accomplished by him, but he was looking, it says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches. That's what faith is. It has eyes always to Christ and his person, what he's accomplished. Just like here, it mentions running a race. I've never seen a runner that's serious about the race that's just running along and looking to the crowds and seeing mom up there kind of waving while they're it's all out once that gun is fired there's a, a direction and this is how the scriptures describe those that the Lord has taught and revealed Christ in that's what that faith is it's the revelation of Christ and his person and his work and What's interesting here that I think we may miss, if you just pull a scripture out of its context, you'll miss what's around it. When it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, what are we looking to? We're looking to one who actually came and ran the race and finished the race. And so... Our coming along is not dependent upon how we run that race, but it's completely tied up as to how he ran that race. That's why he's the author and what? Finisher. Boy, I missed that for years. I thought, okay, there's Christ running. I got to follow his example. Well, if that were the case, he would have never come. You know, wherein we are unable and would be left to ourselves. He not only came, finished the race, reached the goal, and where is he now? Well, he's seated in the heavens. But it says there in verse 3, that's why I say the context, in the end of verse 2, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It's not about our race, it's about his race. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith. It's his race. It's not telling us we better get our running shoes on and make a good run at this thing. No. We look to him who came, endured the cross, despised the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What's he doing sitting there? Well, he finished the work. And he ever lives to intercede on behalf of those that the Father gave him. So I believe that's what we're seen here when it talks about him being the author he's the originator he's the one of who this faith is and the one who's to receive all the glory and the finisher the perfecter of that faith that we see in the work that he came and did now we run a race but the key there, you see in verse 1, is run with patience the race that is set before us. How is it we run with patience? We know that the race isn't dependent upon us and how we do. It's dependent upon him who came and ran the race on our behalf. And therefore, with our eyes fixed upon him, consider what he endured. Consider the race that he ran, and uh, consider his victory as the author and finisher, the completer of that race. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, there's these little key verses you find as you read along in Scripture, and all of a sudden, when the Lord shows you the true sense, you, what it does is it makes you sit down and take a deep breath and thank him. Here's an example right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20. Up in verse 19, it says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yea and nay, 
In other words, he wasn't being preached, well, here's what Christ did. Now, this is what you need to do. No. But in him was yea. And then it explains, for all the promises of God. In him are yea. And in him, amen. We already saw how Christ is the amen. That's a scripture we probably could have used. Under the glory of God by us. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Coming back here to Hebrews 12. That's how he's the author and finisher. He endured the cross and is set down. He despised the shame. The shame of such a death. Being set up against over against the joy that lay before him you say well, what was the joy it was the end result when an author sits down to write a book he knows the end you don't he knows how he's determined how it's going to end and he determines it and that's what we find with christ in this matter of salvation it was given to him by the father delivered to him to do the work and we can say now that all the promises of God are in him, yea, and amen. And that's really our, the hope that is set before us. Who for the hope that was set before him endured the cross, the joy. And uh, what was his joy is our joy when we consider that all of this was done for wretched sinners such as we are. You see how he is the author? God from before the foundation of the world, purposed, even before there was a fall, purposed that he should receive the honor and glory, but that he should come in the flesh and work this out, that God might be just to justify. And that's exactly what he did after a life of obedience. He is the captain of our salvation. That's another way of putting it, the author, the captain. Although tortured and beaten by his sacrificial death, Overcoming all the obstacles, every temptation. He was tried and tempted in all ways, yet without sin. And uh, by his resurrection, you know, you talk about what he faced going to the cross. By his resurrection, he overcame death, opening that new and living way into the holy presence of God. So from womb to cradle, from the desert to wilderness in which he was that little sprout that grew up according to Isaiah 53 to Calvary from the tomb all the way to the throne our Lord Jesus Christ has blazed that trail of grace he truly is the author and finisher of faith I hope that's an encouragement to you I love preparing for it and considering him as such 